So thank you all for joining us. Um, we like to start on time and that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, and now that we have two candidates, the league uh, doesn't do forums with just one candidate. Um, if only one had shown up, we would have given two minutes of time to say something and then psh, so, so I'm glad I have two people because now I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get started. Um, Hi, my name is Athena Paquette Cormier, and this is the uh, candidate forum for the candidates that are running for mayor for the city of Carson. I'm now going to introduce Pamela Thornton, the president of League of Women Voters Torrance Area, who will address us. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's candidate forum hosted by the League of Women Voters of Torrance Area. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose any candidate or political party. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government. We work to increase the understanding of major public policies and influence public policy through education and advocacy. Again, my name is Pamela Thornton and I am the current president of the League of Women Voters of Torrance Areas. We are a local league serving the communities of Carson, Gardena, Harbor City, Lomita, and Torrance. If you are interested in joining our mailing list, please text to 444-999 and enter keyword LWBTA and you will be added to our mailing list. If you need help with your ballot, you can go to votersedge.org. All candidate information is there, as well as information on the ballot measures. And I would also like to thank our voter services director, Ms. Monica Fredericks for coordinating this evening's candidate forum. I thank you for your hours of volunteerism making this a success and we thank you for all that you do for us and our moderator this evening will be athena paquette cormier and then also monica will be our timekeeper so i'm going to turn it back over to athena and thank you for joining us thank you pamela and i see uh mr deers joined us welcome mr deer do you want to just say something so we can make sure your mic's working okay Sure, my name is Jim Deere from Carson, California. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, so um, my job is to give you the structure of what we're gonna do tonight, um, or today, I guess it's not really nighttime, we're used to doing nighttime. Um, I'm just gonna mute everybody so we don't have any feedback. Okay, oh, and Pamela. Okay, so um, the structure today, first is the order of the candidates. I just did it now at random. Uh, who will be first, second, third. Normally when we were in a room, you'd be sitting at a big long table with a mic in front of you. So this is very different, obviously, right? Um, so I drew, uh, I put down the names in a certain order and the order of candidates is uh, Ms. Manny. Am I saying that right, by the way? Okay. Uh, Mr. Robles, Mr. Deer, and then Ms. Davis Holmes. Um, but it's really not important which order you're in because I will rotate the questions. So, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Manny will be going first, but then the next round second will be uh, Mr. Robles and so on. So uh, you're not always gonna be first. You're not always gonna be last. Everyone gets a turn at going first. Um, and uh, let's see what else about that. So that's it about that. Then the structure of the timing is you're gonna start with a two minute opening and then there'll be a two minute closing uh, uh, remarks. And all the questions are one minute long. We don't actually have enough questions because um, we didn't get that many through the email. We have about 10 or 12. So we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, if you guys wanna write a question, write it in the chat box. And then Pamela will make sure that it's uh, worded appropriately and neutrally and so on. And also make sure that your question is directed to all candidates. So in other words, you can't say candidate to, uh, why do you do this all the time, right? So it has to be a question that, that all candidates can answer. Um, so some of the ground rules that are important to keep in mind, the candidates will not refer to each other by name, but speak in the first person. So say what you think, 
not what you think of the other guy uh, or gal, and no personal attacks will be allowed. Uh, we want to hear what the candidates think they will do in office. And again, not what you think of the other person uh, and what they do or their haircut or something. No talking over each other, which becomes simple. What I'm going to recommend is as soon as you're done speaking, uh, put yourself back on mute. And um, that way there's no chance that you're talking over each other. But also it minimizes your mic picking up sounds that then will put your picture over someone else's voice. So here's sometimes what happens with Zoom is if you're not muted, someone's talking and your picture will pop up, right? Which looks really weird. <laughs> so, so to avoid that kind of thing, we'll just always mute ourselves when, when we're not speaking. Then also you'll address uh, me, the moderator, not each other with questions. And if you ever want a question repeated, I'm more than glad to do that. And it doesn't come out of your time. I'll back up a second. With your questions, you don't have to use the entire minute, but you can't, uh, you can't yield your time to another question or yield your time to another candidate. Once that question's done, if you didn't use up the time, that's it for that. Although it does help us get more questions in if, you, if you're succinct and you don't have more to say, just that's fine. Okay, so that is that for the candidates ground rules. Um, then for the audience, um, so the chat room is like you're in uh, an auditorium. So we still have our uh, league de decorum rules, if you want to call them that. So no name calling, no foul language. Um, yes, cheer on your candidate whenever they say something brilliant. We love that. That's what the chat room is actually for. Um, and so uh, we will, we reserve the right to bounce anyone who takes the low road in the behavior department. Um, so, because it's not fair to everybody else watching if there's that kind of stuff going on. I've been a part of that before where I was joining and the chat room was so full of stuff that I just disconnected because it was just so ugly. So we don't want to go there, right? Um, okay. So, and don't be worried. We are recording this. I even checked the recording is going and the little bubble cloud thing is by my name. So we are recording. Usually within 20 to 48 hours, our editor will have the intro outro done and like even out the sound because sometimes one mic is louder than the other and it's hard to listen to that. So that will all be polished up. However, we don't truncate or edit the actual talk. So for example, um, it's, it's just going to be one long video. Um, if you see any videos out there that say they're from the league and they're parts of a video, that's not us, okay? Okay, so now that we understand all that stuff, we are ready to begin. So um, as I said, we're going to do our two-minute uh, beginning opening statements. Um, I don't see that Miss Miss Davis Holmes is here, uh, so I'll just be skipping her number till she appears if she does appear. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get... Oh, I forgot about the timer. My gosh, I've done so many of these forums that like I'm skipping stuff now. So Monica is going to be timing, and so keep an eye for her her box there. She'll give you in this opening two minutes. Isn't that cute, right? <laughs> Low technology. <laughs> so um, so with your two minutes, she'll give you a one minute uh, signal, a thirty second, fifteen second, then stop. Um, whenever you see the stop sign, finish your thought. Like don't just stop in the middle of a sentence, but also don't start a whole new idea and the and 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 thing because we again want to be respectful of everyone's time uh for each question um and then on the one minute questions she'll give you 30 seconds 15 seconds and then the stop sign again okay so i think i covered everything that's important for you to know so we'll go ahead and get started ms manny you can start with your two minute opening remarks Hi, thank you again uh, for hosting this. My name is Anna Many. I am 41 years old, lifelong Carson resident. I've gone to school here my whole life with the exception of high school. I was bused out to Banning High School in Wilmington. And I also got my associates as a working adult through the PACE program at Harbor College. Uh, I've been a 24 plus year employee with the city of Carson. So I've been here for the numerous changes. I've 
2006, so I've had over 14 years. And since 2017, I've served as president of Ask Me Local 809 City of Carson Employees. I represent the majority of the represented employees. Every single facet in the city uh, services are provided to the community are actually manned by my members. So I'm well versed across the city of every single uh, program services offered to our residents. Uh, but another big factor of difference is that what's uh, very personal to us is the fact that the majority of my membership are also Carson residents. We have a well vested interest of what's going on with the city and it's disheartening with the, the path that we've gone through, which is why I felt compelled to actually run for office is because the, our bad decisions of our elected officials have, have financial consequences that are continue to be balanced off of the backs of the workforce. We can't continue like this and the lack of transparency from our local government and the lack of faith that our residents have in our officials is what's compelled me to have to run. And I feel it's time for a change. We have not had anybody outside of our current uh, crop of elected officials who have served in capacity yeah, as mayor. Everyone who's come in as mayor has been a current existing council member or another elected position. So we're, we're overdue for change. All the consequences our officials have put us through is more than enough. We can't tolerate this anymore. And I want to thank you very much. Thank you. So next, Mr. Robles, your two-minute rem opening remarks. Mr. Robles, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Can you start his time yes. over, Monica? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. And thank you for the league for hosting this event and for the vital service that you provide to the South Bay and around the country each and every day in terms of educating people on their civic responsibility and engagement with our government. Um, I grew up here in Carson, uh, attended Carson Street Elementary School, Stephen M. White Junior High School, back when they were called junior high schools, and graduated from Norbon High School as a magnet student. Uh, first in my family to graduate from high school. I received a scholarship to go to the University of Colorado, where I received my uh, bachelor's degree, double majoring in Latin American studies and political science. I have a master's degree from USC, where I was a USC merit scholarship recipient. And I also have my Juris Doctorate degree from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, formerly known as Bolt Hall. Uh, where I graduated with honors. Um, I'm seeking re-election to my second term as the mayor of this great city of Carson. And I asked the voters and residents of Carson to gauge whether or not I'm deserving of being re-elected by looking at the facts. And the facts are compare what Carson was like before I was elected to my first term four years ago and to where we are now, even during this pandemic situation. And I submit that whether it's reduced crime, greater um, development opportunities coming to Carson in terms of more restaurants, uh, more uh, the, um, um, housing at all levels of affordability, whatever level you may want to um, rate Carson on, Carson is better today and therefore, I would all due respect to my opponents, I deserve to be reelected. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Mr. Deere, your two minute opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jim Deere, and I'm delighted to be on this panel today. I want to thank the uh, Torrance uh, branch, the League of Women Voters, for all the good work you've done over the years. I've been in your forums and Previous years, as you know, I was the mayor of Carson for 11 years. And uh, during those 11 years, the city of Carson transformed from um, uh, more of a, a sleepy uh, community uh, to a destination community. And I led the effort, uh, I was a primary uh, cheerleader on making that happen. And uh, my leadership, of course, worked with the other council members and uh, the community and the staff uh, brought forward a big change in the city of Carson. Every year I was mayor, um, pretty much every year the crime rate went down. So it was pretty low, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, we can keep it low. 
The thing is about the city of Carson is that it has tremendous potential to be uh, certainly the jewel of the South Bay. Uh, we need to reach that potential. In order to do that, the elected officials have to work as a team. And as you know, over the past uh, two years, I've come out as uh, certainly the voice of reason on this current city council. I'm running for mayor because of the people of Carson have approached me and they have asked me to run for mayor. I am a council member elected two years ago and I have a tremendous track record while I was in elected office. And I think a pretty good track record now bringing compromise and peace to the table. And uh, we are kind of in a mode of uh, treading water. And I think that we need to advance our city, move the city forward. Uh, we can do that under my leadership. I've proven it in the past and I can certainly do that again. So thank you very, very much. And I look forward to the questions today. Thank you, Mr. Deer. Okay, so we're skipping candidate four. Um, so now we start our questions. So uh, since Ms. Many went first, next is Mr. Robles. You're now gonna take this first question first. <clears throat> so the first one is, what is the best way to handle Carson's homeless population? What types of outreach programs are in place and run by the city? How would you improve those programs? Thank you. Uh, the number one cause of the homelessness population is a lack of housing, a lack of housing at all levels of affordability. And during my tenure as mayor, we have constructed and approved for construction and development more housing development than most cities around the South Bay area. And I'm very, very proud of that, including the very, very first veterans housing development here in the city of Carson. I was involved in that from the very, very beginning from the concept through the development stages is at the corner of Figueroa and Carson Street. And if you drive by, you think it's an expensive, uh, well-to-do um, condominium complex, but veterans who previously were homeless can live there for about $300 a month for a, a studio apartment, which is great. We also have a very aggressive program where we go to our local parks and we um, allow homeless people to come in and use our facility for showering and we provide them medical mobile assistance uh, and clothing to help them during this difficult transition. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Deer, this is your question now. Thank you. The uh, homeless situation in Carson uh, though not as severe uh, overall as some of the surrounding communities, it's still very, very uh, concerning for all of us. I'm sure my colleagues would agree with that. We need to address this issue, and there's no question about uh, doing programs that really uh, have a success. Now, we have a um, shelter in, in Carson uh, run by Victory Outreach Church but we actually could use uh, a lot more uh, outreach than that than one church doing that. Our Sheriff's Department has a very proactive assistance program to help the homeless, and we have a very, very uh, aggressive uh, housing development projects going on. As I was mayor, um, interesting enough, we built quite a few um, affordable housing units in Carson as well. So we are really uh, a city that is concerned about the homeless. And as a mayor, I will make sure that that concern is addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now Ms. Many, this is your question. The number one issue with homelessness is actually the lack of affordable housing. The problem with all the majority of the new developments that are being built throughout the city, it is on the high end scale. And we there, and also there has to be education with the general public that there's a distinct difference between what is considered affordable housing and what is low income housing. Uh, the new complex that's being built right now across the street from Carson City Hall, starting price is twenty two hundred dollars for a studio bedroom. That it far exceeds the majority. Our Carson residents can't afford it. Right outside of my union office is part of a strip that the county allows for people to park their overnight RVs. It's not that stereotypical. Perception 
perception of what you think a homeless person is. These individuals go up and get up and go to work every single day, but because they can't afford rent, they're living out of their RVs. That is a problem that I face every single day. So many of my members have moved out of the city because they can't afford to live in the very city they work in. And that is a problem. And we need to have affordable housing and need to be open to it and work with organizations like PATH which help not only with the workforce, but uh, job placement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question, uh, Mr. Deer, you're gonna take this one first. Okay. So, um, okay, how do you think the city should promote, promote economic development? Well, that is my forte. Uh, as the mayor of the city, I transformed, a, led the transformation to a destination community and I outlined a very detailed economic development strategy and a public safety plan that we implemented as a city government. Um, the staff, the elected officials in the community came together to bring forward uh, a series of restaurants to be opened. Uh, when I was elected uh, city council member, I started a restaurant task force because we had not had a new chain restaurant on, table service restaurant open in 20 years in Carson. I called that an economic route and I went to work to develop um, many, many uh, resources uh, to bring forward lots of development in the city. That development, uh, the reason for that development is not just to create amenities and jobs, but it also creates revenue for the city so we can increase our public safety. It all worked together and uh, I would continue that program. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Ms. Many, this is your question. Thank you. Well, what was tried and true before is not gonna necessarily work for us considering a COVID-19. At this point, we're at the point of needing to uh, rework and help our small business community. So many uh, businesses are shuttered. So the tagline of what we would have promoted before is not gonna work. It's new to every entity. So, you know, in all fairness to our current elected officials, but at the time right now, it's a survival mode. So what we need to be doing is advocating, how do we help these businesses uh, survive the shutdown of COVID-19? No entity has ever had to deal with that before. So I, I understand this is new ground for everybody, but what was tried and true is not gonna work. And you have to step outside the box and be considerate and truly find out what exactly we need to do to help our business community. The easiest thing the city could have done is to immediately waive the business license fees because those are monies that were not collected for all of our businesses in our community that especially were shut down because of COVID. That's an immediate thing they could do, not just waive late fees. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And now Mr. Robles, this is your question. Remember to unmute yourself. Thank you. I wanna give credit where credit is due. Uh, there was a great deal of economic development activity while uh, Mr. Deere was mayor, but the facts are the facts. Greater economic development has occurred during my four years since being elected to my first term than previously, than ever. I invite the residents, I invite our neighboring, uh, our neighbors to come into Carson to drive around and you will see that there's economic boom going on in the city of Carson. But with that said, it is true that the COVID pandemic has uh, disproportionately impacted small businesses. And what have we done in Carson? We created our very own, with the support of uh, Mayor Pro Tem Deer, our very own small business assistance program uh, to help small businesses weather through this pandemic and also created our very own uh, rental assistance program to our residents to get them past this <coughs> pandemic that we're currently experiencing. And we also had the very first testing site here in Carson that was available to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Ms. Manny, you're gonna take this next question first. Um, and I, I encourage you not to mention the other uh, candidates because that's what usually starts things escalating. So please don't. Um, okay, Ms. Many, the next question says, um, I hear a lot of concerns about keeping Carson safe, in quotes. What do you think are the safety issues for our city? Do you have a solution for Carson's gang situation? So safety for me is a little bit different considering um, it was impacted. My family was impacted. My father just a few years ago was shot on my driveway while he was waiting for me to be picked up by two young um, African-American men. 
who uh, they weren't necessarily tied to a string of robberies, but part of this is civic engagement. People will look out for each other more often when there's a sense of pride and connection to our community. And we need to do more engagement uh, throughout the year, not necessarily an annual event when we have like uh, the community outreach. So it has to be an everyday situation. It has to be sincere. And we have to go out to the people, not necessarily the people who come to us, because those who are the most high at risk, you'll never see them at city programs. We need to send people out to them. We need to send out and speak to the different community groups. We need to speak to the our former gangsters and tie them in with the sheriff's department because it's a, it's not just no amount of, of police force is going to help the situation. It's a matter of that community engagement that we're seriously lacking. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Robles, this is your question now. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Uh, it does take a, a village. It does take community engagement. And I'm very proud of the fact that here in Carson, we created and implemented and now been emulated across the county and across the state, the SFAN program that was initiated by our former uh, colleague of mine, uh, Council Member Alito M. Santorina, uh, where we engage directly with the residents um, and volunteers walk hand in hand with sheriff deputies to go door to door, engaging the residents and asking them to get involved. And that has resulted, there's a direct correlation in the decrease in the crime statistics that we've been able to enjoy over the last few years. Also a big problem that needs to be addressed are the vacant lots. Vacant lots, depressed surrounding property values, their public safety hazards, and these vacant lots and underutilized lots need to be developed. And more vacant lots and underutilized lots have been developed during my tenure than ever before. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Deer, this is your question now. Thank you. You know that the, uh, the issue of public safety is certainly my primary concern uh, above other things, uh, above economic development and other aspects of uh, leadership in the city. Because without security, we can't do all the other good things that a city can do for its residents. So that's very, very important. I want to emphasize that. I do recall that in the past, we had an issue where gang members were claiming our parks. Uh, Anna, you remember that you, in the 1990s. Uh, they were claiming it as their turf. It was unbelievable how they took control of our parks. And I initiated something called the Park Enforcement Team with the Citizens Group. That Park Enforcement Team took the parks back from the gang members. I want to take that same concept that costs a, a little over a million dollars a year to operate and uh, do the economic development to bring five to ten million dollars more in revenue and put that concept for the entire city of Carson. And it can be done. It's a, um, uh, a possibility that only requires a willpower and we have that willpower in Carson. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder, don't address the other candidates when you're speaking, please. Okay, um, so next, uh, Ms. Manny, you're gonna take this question next. Are you ready? How do you feel about the transportation options currently available in Carson? Do, you have, do we have enough options? If not, what will you do to increase those options? Well, first off, we, I'm not even sure if they've actually reactivated our Carson circuit, our transit, our mass transit. Um, the city had shut that down um, during COVID and had set up a program through Lyft, which disproportionately goes against, you know, most minorities considering that the reason why they take public transit is because they can't afford uh, rideshare programs like Lyft and Uber, even with the discount. I don't think we have enough routes. Uh, we, the city still hasn't um, had an opportunity or even made it a priority to do a full transit evaluation, ridership and everything to see it, where the needs are, where the time frames are, whether it's schooling, you know, whether or not we need to set up tripper buses or anything of that sort. We need to beef up our uh, mass transit if we're going to sit there and start working about the environment and getting less vehicles off the streets and so and also we need to connect more with the metro lines but we definitely need to bring our mass transit back on if it hasn't been activated already mm -hmm. but also to reevaluate the lines and also provide more routes throughout the city thank you okay, thank you and mr robles 
Thank you. Uh, the city has more bicycle routes than ever before. We've evaluated um, the mass transit system here within the city. And what we've learned is that very, very few residents utilize that. I'm very, very proud of the fact that we have pioneered here in the South Bay the, in a partnership with Lyft to, you, to subsidize the residents' use of this rideshare system uh, where they get up to $10 per ride if they start at a destination in the city and they end at a destination in the city. And up to 20 rides per month, that has become a model. Other cities are looking at doing that. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that not only was that initiated here in Carson, that I brought that forward to the city. And um, it's, it's a great program. Everyone, the right ridership is increasing. We've also started to deal with the, our dollar ride system and having them expand their service. So I'm very, very excited, but you can always improve and I look forward to making improvements to it. Thank you. And Mr. Deer, this is now your question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the transportation in various forms really needs the attention of, of a city government because on all levels, Many people have different transportation needs. I disagree with shutting down our transit system. Uh, we still fortunately have a metro system. We have the Long Beach Transit, Torrance Transit serving the community of Carson, but not the Carson circuit. Um, I believe that was a mistake, but uh, you know, it is what it is at this point. We really uh, have to be sure that when we find out what the needs are through surveys, through uh, active participation of our residents, we can find out what best suits. Some people do ride their, ride their bikes in Carson, uh, including myself. And um, we do have uh, uh, funding available through grants. We're, we're reactivating a grant now that was uh, that expired. And we're doing a, a lot of things to, to outreach. And I agree that the outreach is really important because we have to know exactly what the needs are before we outline exactly how we set the transportation systems up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we will start with Mr. Robles. Um, and the next question is, who has endorsed you and have you received campaign donations from any group, union, or business? Thank you. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, Governor Newsom has endorsed me. He it's not often that he engages in races at uh, the municipal level like this. I'm very proud of the fact that he's endorsed my candidacy for re-election. I'm very proud of the fact that both our state senator, uh, Steve Bradford, and our state assembly member, uh, who's the chair of the Democratic Legislative Caucus, uh, have endorsed my candidacy. Um, in terms of labor unions, I'm very, very proud of the fact that not only do I have the support of the laborers union, but they've contributed to my campaign in re-election. I'm very proud of the fact that I have the support of the carpenters who have also contributed to my campaign. I'm also very proud of the fact that I have the endorsement and support of the electrical workers who have also stepped up and, and contributed to my campaign. Now I realize receiving campaign contributions to some civic minded individuals may be uh, improper, but that is our system. And it takes money to campaign, and that's where the money comes from. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Mr. Deer. Thank you. I've been endorsed by our, our water director, Harold William, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, he was a former colleague on the city council, and he was very, very active in the community as we speak. So I also have been endorsed by the mayor of the city of Gardena, Tasha Serta, the first African-American woman mayor in the history of that city. Uh, I've been endorsed by uh, many community uh, leaders, uh, too long of a list to, to mention right now, but I do want to mention the uh, organized labor unions, SEIU, which represents some of the city of Carson employees, um, contribute to me and have officially endorsed me. Also, the Teamsters District Council 42 uh, has um, endorsed my candidacy. We um, have a, a, a lot of um, uh, organizations like Carson Alliance for Truth have, has endorsed me. Uh, we really have Democratic clubs because I'm a Democrat 
and I'm, we're all Democrats, uh, endorsed me. The Martin Luther King Jr. Democratic Clubs endorsed me, the a Progressive Democratic Club, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Manny. Hi. Yes, I've got received an endorsement of Ashton District Council 36, which represents Southern California, and also of my local Ask Me Local 809. Even though I'm within labor, I did not actively seek any endorsement from any elected officials, quite honestly. Every single elected officials got baggage tied to them, and I just didn't want to be connected to any of it. Uh, that's one of the issues that residents are actually quite tired of. And that was the feedback I've been getting the last four years. I only decided a few months ago to run for office because I felt compelled, but I felt as if it was more free to not be connected to any elected official, whether or not they privately had endorsed me and, and I have their vote. It's actually been quite freeing about that. And also the different labor unions. Um, I'm not surprised that they went with, you know, their traditional who they've always supported in the, in the past. Um, because they don't know what real labor is locally and how certain people have acted towards labor. And I'm fine with that because at the end of the day, the people are going to be voting is Carson voters. And Carson voters are quite honestly tired of all of our elected officials and ready for someone new and not be me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Deere, you're going to take the next question first. And the question is, okay. what, what do you know about ADUs? How can Carson make the process of permits and building more streamlined for homeowners who are not contractors and want to build ADUs on their property? ADUs meaning uh, the second homes uh, on the same lot, is that what you mean? Right, the accessory dwelling units, the right. granny flats or granny flat lot flat. quarters, whatever. Right. <laughs> okay well you know that's a state legislation that's uh, trying to um, you know uh, overrule local control of, of of zoning and it is an issue not just for carson but for all the south bay cities uh, we really don't like sacramento uh, trying to govern the way we uh, do zoning and permitting in the city of carson i'm sure the other cities in the south bay feel the same way carson does uh, but of course it was done to increase housing so if it's done properly and safely, I'm not really opposed to second units on the on the lot. If the lot's large enough, what I don't want is uh, over parking uh, problems created um, by too many too much density. So you know we have to take it on a case by case basis, and uh, I would look at it in that in that manner. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Manny. This is your question now. Yeah. I actually just spoke to a Carson resident yesterday who was uh, going through the process, the permit process for ADU, and that was a, a, a very mind-blowing experience to find out that the city's process, because of delays, therefore it incurred additional costs for our resident. They put in their plans and it was a, approved in December, but because of some law changes or whatever, they were not grandfathered in, and now they've incurred an additional cost. They have to do their maps all over again in January. And also, too, there's a lack of communication uh, that they can find through our city's website that would help assist these individuals. And so it's, it's frustrating on them, and also it's a financial drain. And that goes with everything with the cities relating to zoning, is how important they reevaluate the zoning after a general plan. Zoning hasn't been mastered overhaul since the last general plan, I believe, in 04. So this goes back into a bigger problem, which is, does the city um, ever take into consideration updating the zoning and also to coordinating with the county mm -hmm. to make sure that the permit process mm -hmm. is being as mm -hmm. streamless as, mm -hmm. as possible? My apologies, but we we've got to be we got to be consistent and we have to be realistic and practical for our residents because we're making them have an additional cost that they don't need to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Robles. Yes, uh, this is to help alleviate the housing shortage, which is causing um, the homelessness problem. And the homelessness problem, it, there, a big component of it is the lack of uh, housing, affordable housing, and also mental illness. But with respect to ADAs addressing the shortage of housing, the, it, it's not a, it, there shouldn't be a one size fits all. As I indicated here in Carson, we've been doing a great job and fulfilling our role and responsibility to alleviating the housing shortage. Other cities have not. And I think that those other cities need to bear their fair responsibility. 
And if they refuse to, then these ADA and the other housing proposals that have been in, introduced in Sacramento um, have merit because the housing shortage is statewide. And all of us, every single city, every municipality up and down the state needs to take the responsibility to build uh, sufficient housing for residents and future residents. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so Ms. Manny, you're gonna take the next question first. If you had to cut one thing from the budget, what would it be? Oh, easy, reduce legal services. Our legal fees have been astronomical and increase every single year. And with every single dollar, that's robbing us of our services to our residents. Time and time again, residents would come to council, ask for assistance, whether it be their youth groups, whether it be senior programs, or it be stroke center. And the city always says, we don't have the money. We don't have the money. That's not true. They have the money. They're selective of where they spend it. And they also hide how they spend it. And so if there was anything I would do, not eliminate in, in the entirety, but reduce drastically is the amount of money we pay in legal services. And also too, the city needs to take a hard look at all of our contract services that we receive with LA County. LA County has drastically increased their fees, but yet there hasn't been a thorough audit of what exactly we're getting for it. We have, the sheriff's contract has been increased again, but yet the services have been slightly reduced. We also have other contract services. We have the animal patrol and the city was in the process of doing it internally. Still haven't finalized that because of their, I believe they quadrupled the price. So there's so many contract services that need to be reevaluated. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robles. Thank you. Um, simple fact is that uh, during my tenure as mayor, we attained the highest general fund reserve ever in the history of Carson. Uh, in fact, we have about 50% of our, this year's physical budget in the bank right now. Very, very few cities up and down the state of California can claim that. And I'm very proud of the fiscal responsibility that we've engaged upon. So proud, in fact, that earlier this year, for the first time ever, Standard & Poor's, again, um, improved our bond rating, which will result in additional savings into the future. Uh, what we need to do is not so much reduce or eliminate services for the residents, we need to increase the efficiency and how they're delivered and improve upon them and make them even better. Because the city of Carson, we have the resources uh, unlike other surrounding cities. Okay, thank you. Mr. Deer. Thank you, I will answer the question. That is, uh, if I had to pick one, I would look at how we are spending undue hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, even into the millions over, over the years in consulting fee. We're hiring consultants. In some cases it's appropriate, other cases not appropriate. At one point our planning department had a consulting contract on and they kept asking for more extensions uh, I really feel that we should have city employees doing city work. If we can't, uh, we don't have an employee that can do it and needs a consultant to help make it happen, that's fine because the end result is what's important. But I think that the consulting fees uh, would be what I would look at first. And then I wouldn't just cut in one area, I'd cut in many different areas uh, that could be um, approach without reducing services. And I guess we'd have to look at it in detail. It's hard to answer that in one minute, but uh, I do think that we need to uh, look at our budget because we have a deficit every single year for the past few years. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question goes to Mr. Robles first. And the question is, I try to mix it up so you don't get the same one twice. Okay. What is the most important issue facing Carson right now not to do with COVID? The re-election of the next mayor. Uh, there's a decision that the voters need to make uh, whether or not uh, they want to continue the forward progress that we have embarked upon since uh, I was elected to my first term four years ago, or if we want to go back or go sideways uh, to the right uh, under the leadership of, of someone who has a different idea. Uh, the facts speak for themselves. Uh, we also have on the ballot, Measure K. I don't know if that's a question that to come, but 
Measure K is proposing to increase the sales tax in Carson from nine and a half percent to 10 and a quarter. I'm opposed to it. I voted against it on the city council. I'm, I've been campaigning against it. It makes absolutely no sense to increase our sales tax during this COVID pandemic, uh, especially on our businesses and our residents. And if we do increase it and Torrance will keep the nine and a half percent sales tax, all the shoppers will go to Torrance costing Carson millions of dollars in sales tax and lost sales tax revenue. Okay, thank you. Mr. Deer, this is your question now. Uh, thank you very much. It goes back to something I mentioned a little bit earlier today. And I believe the issue is public safety. As I mentioned before, I don't mean to be redundant, but all the other good things that we can do as a community really pivots on whether or not people are secure in their homes, on their streets, when they're shopping. And that security is very, very important. So I would say that um, if I had my druthers, if I had a magic wand and I could just fix something just like that, I would bring the, the safety and security level because we have a lot of shootings going on in Carson, uh, fortunately, not fatalities. But that needs to come to a stop. Uh, it, it can be done. Uh, if we have a public safety plan that we implement. I believe that we can reduce that down to a minimum and ideally uh, reduce it completely. But I think that all the economic development, all the public art, all the good things, programs for seniors and youth, uh, those are important, but security is the number one. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Many. The number one issue we have at the city is that we need to stabilize the infrastructure. The city's infrastructure is beyond, it's just a nightmare. It's one of the reasons why I'm running for office. It's a sure fact that uh, you could tell by walk driving around the streets in the city. It's a haves and have nots. There are parts of the city that have been far ignored for far too long. You, we have to take care of the basic needs of the city. Make sure our roads are paved. Make sure the grounds are taken care of. Make sure that our business community, that we're truly business friendly and make sure our constituents are taken care of. We can't do that if the city's house is on fire. And so it's constant over and over again that our city council has not kept our city's upper management in check. They have allowed them to run amok, therefore reduces the programs and services, the quality of it to the residents. I go, I don't know how far long our residents are going to continue to allow to tolerate this. We have to stop this and it starts from the top and that's why we need change. We need someone who actually understands the city's infrastructure and has to be able to call BS out on management when they're doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next question goes first to Mr. Robles and the question is, Carson residents would like to shop in Carson and not give our tax dollars to surrounding cities when shopping. Carson only has two major supermarkets. With all the new housing development in Carson, do you see this as a good time to reach out to Sprouts, Trader Joe's, or something similar? Well, we have more than two, um, but needless to say, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that um, while there is a need for certain neighborhoods to have their own grocery store. Um, we've invited Trader Joe's repeatedly to come into the city, but what they say is the population uh, threshold ha has not fully been reached by the city of Carson. Hence, the economic development of more housing will allow for more residents to come into Carson, thus us, us as a city reaching the requisite threshold that a Trader Joe's or even a Whole Foods uh, requires before they invest in, in a community. I'm very proud of the fact that we're gonna be announcing within the next month, I'll announce it here first, that we have another grocery store coming into the city of Carson. Um, and that will be announced in the next uh, uh, week or so. And um, again, while the city of Carson is almost 20 square miles and not and, and not every neighborhood is saturated sufficiently with uh, options of a grocery store, we're, we're getting there. Okay, thank you. Mr. Deer. Thank you. You know, grocery stores are very important. They're an amenity that uh, provides a service to our residents that, uh, of course, people have food, have to have food, but we, we really have to have good quality 
food, not just a grocery store that just serves uh, uh, second second rate. So we do have a, a, a few supermarkets in Carson and a number of medium and smaller chain markets in Carson as well. Uh, but I believe that North Carson, uh, of course, under my mayorship, we had a, a Ralph's. It was a small Ralph's. It got converted uh, after I left to a uh, 99 cent store, uh, something I didn't agree with, but I wasn't on the city council at the time. Uh, so I would think that uh, we really have to bring back more opportunity for people to have a selection of high quality food. That happens when you have a complete economic development program and plan in, in action. It doesn't happen in a bubble. It doesn't happen by itself. It happens because we do other things to make it happen. Okay, thank, thank you. And Ms. Many. I know there's sort of a lot of concern for people wanting in particular uh, stores like Trader Joe's and Sprouts, but in talking with uh, quite a few residents from the south side and the east side, they just want a grocery store, period. Something that would be within walking distance. And at this point, since they have no grocery stores, this is, you know, the arguments that we have about grocery stores in the community are two different realms of people. Ones who want certain high-end markets and other people who just want affordable groceries. And so, you know, there's a clear distinction between the community of neither here nor there. Yes, there is definitely a need, but also too is I, I do understand about the density, the lack of density of the population, which also hinders us. But once again, that goes back to the city's responsibility to educate the public. It's not that the city council is not trying, but there are things that hinder them. So for me, it's grocery store period that's needed. We have nothing on the east side of the city. And that's why part of the general plan also includes that we're two distinct neighborhoods, the Dominguez area and the east area known as the patch. We're in dire need of a grocery store. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next question goes first to Mr. Deer. Do you believe there should be rent control in Carson more strict than what exists at the state level? In Carson, our rent control only applies to mobile home parks. It's a rate stabilization ordinance that originally was set up in the late 1980s and has been very, very successful. In the last few years, um, again, when I was not on the city council uh, for those few years, uh, the city council voted to change that ordinance and uh, weaken it uh, where it costs uh, maybe less money to operate the Mobile Home Rental Review Board and the staff and so forth, but uh, it has a mixed review as far as uh, protecting the residents. People who live in mobile homes are different than people who live in, uh, in apartments. And when you own your mobile home, the owner of the property uh, the itself has you over a barrel because mobile homes nowadays are not really mobile, especially if they get older and you can't move them anywhere, meaning that you can't find a location that will accept it. So it's it's a misnomer to say they're a mobile home, actually. So we do have that, and I believe we need to maintain that and strengthen it. And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Many, what are your thoughts on this? I've heard it from different, um, uh, different owners, those who own apartment complexes that don't have a mortgage and those who do have a mortgage. And so to all fairness, I understand their hesitance about the idea of rent control uh, because they also have bills to pay versus in comparison to somebody who owns a property outright and owns no money on it. So for them, it's clear you know, profit. But to all fairness, I would have to actually analyze the data statewide. I do understand about the mobile home parks issues, about the rent control, which is great that we have as the city, but it's not going to do us any good if the mobile home park is sold and then therefore, you know, turned into either a condo conversion or actually what's happening right now at the Imperial Avalon Estates, where they are in the fight right now for getting a fair market value. So, you know, I'm a little hesitant to discuss anything other than I need to, I would actually need to analyze the data statewide, whether or not the pros and cons regarding that. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robles, what do you think about that? Thank you. Well, you know, I, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we strengthened um, our rent control ordinance that applies to mobile home parks. In fact, we strengthened it so much that it's become the most restrictive one in the entire state of California and has been recognized 
by the California Supreme Court as such, and we voted for it. So what did we do? We tweaked it. Unlike the city of LA, for example, and if I hope I'm not cut off for picking on the city of LA, but <laughs> the city of LA, uh, they have a rent control that allows for a CPI increase of 3% or 4% every year. Um, in the city of Carson, we introduced that and allowed that at our mobile home parks, but up to 75% of the CPI. So in other words, less than CPI. And the Supreme Court has stated, the California Supreme Court has stated that going any lower than that would have been unconstitutional and not valid. So we are literally the strictest in the state. And I'm very proud of that. And our mobile home residents support it. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're on to the next question. Uh, let's see. So, uh, Ms. Manny, you're going to go first on this one. Um, how would you balance the city budget and what are your top three priorities? As far as the city budget, uh, we definitely have to review all the contract services that we have. Throughout the year, you constantly see management coming back to city council to keep approving for back owed bills. They do not have a good handle on it, nor has the council considered that a focus to evaluate the effectiveness of these contracts, whether or not they're properly encumbered and my, my apologies, appropriated. And so it's what is a necessity and what is a luxury. You start off with that and do not encumber more than what we receive. And also too, we also need to uh, be a little bit more conservative in the revenue projections, because I know that in the past that's been part of the problem is that when they've been a little bit high in the expectation, in the returns, including with measures, previous measures, and it comes out far less. So I think it would be prudent of the city council to be a little bit more conservative than what staff may possibly recommend. So that will be more in line. But the contract services need to be overhauled and reevaluated. And uh, it starts from there. That is a majority of our costs. Okay, thank you. Mr. Robles. Thank you. Um, Again, the facts, we can talk about the facts or alternative facts. The fact is that every year since I've been elected mayor, since I've been mayor, we've approved the budget, a balanced budget on time for the first time in decades. And that has resulted in Standard & Poor's improving our bond rating for the first time in decades. This isn't me saying it. This isn't someone else on the council saying it or someone running for mayor. This is Standard & Poor's and the other bond rating agencies. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that every year at the close of the fiscal year, our revenues exceed our expenditures, resulting in Carson having the highest reserves ever, not just like in the last 10 years, ever from the beginning of the founding of Carson until now, our reserves are the highest. Those are the facts. People may try to argue alternative facts because they're members of a different party, but the facts are the facts. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Deer, what do you think about this? Oh, uh, thank you. Well, uh, this question was like designed for me. Uh, at every budget workshop, uh, public opportunity, I explain that because we have a structural deficit in the city of Carson, which means that we spend more money than we take in, we need to look at it differently. We need to stop spending more money than we take in. According to our staff, we have a deficit uh, that gets filled uh, in the last few years with money from the reserves. We transfer money from the reserves. Well, anybody can balance a budget by taking money from the reserves. And as far as having a balanced budget, the state law says every city must have a balanced budget. So that's why we have a balanced budget. But, you know, it's like a, you're taking from your savings account to put in your checking account so you can pay all your bills. That's what happens in the city of Carson. We need to stop spending more money than we're taking in. We've been fortunate with one time uh, money coming into the city uh, so that we can put money in reserves. But as far as the budget itself, it needs to be straightened out. It's important. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question, we're going to start with Mr. Robles. With the state budget shortfall because of COVID, will Carson be affected? And if so, how do you see Carson recovering, I guess, from this shortfall? 
Well, again, we're fortunate that in Carson, we enjoy a healthy reserve, which we can look at as a rainy day fund that will take us through the pandemic. Again, those are the facts. We can argue uh, alternative facts, but real facts and the reality that I live in, that's what the books say. But what the state of California has done is they've allowed businesses to defer paying their sales tax income. And that has resulted in the present revenues being reduced uh, for the city of Carson. They haven't forgiven it. They haven't excused those sales tax revenues. They've just allowed them to be delayed by businesses to help them get through and weather this uh, current pandemic situation. So my hope is that uh, when we start coming out of this pandemic, that the businesses that uh, did not pay their sales tax revenue on time will start repaying it and Carson will be replenished with the anticipated revenues that we had. But in Carson, we're very, very fortunate that we have a very diverse uh, base in terms of helping sustain the city, not only from sales tax revenues, we have uh, property tax revenues that have gone up every year since I've been elected uh, and other revenues too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Deer. Uh, thank you for the question. You know that um, in the city of Carson, when we uh, look at the the economic situation and the, the future of the of the economy of our city, we have to take in in the fact that we have a lot of businesses in Carson that are closing up. We did act as a city council to get a um, um, a very generous uh, loan program to supplement the federal loan programs, and that was a good idea. We also um, uh, hired a consultant, and the consultant uh, was very beneficial to a lot of our businesses that were struggling with the applications and the requirements to get federal money. So that federal money has come to a number of businesses in Carson. But um, you know we have a lot of restaurants that are have closed down, and we need to uh, reevaluate exactly how we tax, when I say tax, fees and business licenses. We have to really take in consideration that the city has to work together as a partner with our businesses in Carson to bring forward a system to help them succeed. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Many. I'm worried about what our actual true financial situation is, considering that the city management had reported to the employees that the city would go bankrupt if they kept every single employee on the payroll for June 30th because of the COVID-19. I have little faith in the city because the cities um, had no idea what exactly was uh, appropriated. It was just a group sum total, you know, that was provided. And so I have little faith in what exactly our situation is what our true numbers are because we've been told for this whole year of 2020 we don't have the money city doesn't have the money and so what is it do we have the money or do we not if we have the money there was no reason for the city to keep uh, sending all of them employees home there's no reason why the city couldn't financially support our local small businesses to help them while they were waiting for the federal assistance and so i have little faith in what exactly anything the city says considering they are compulsive liars when it comes to the money thank you okay thank you um okay so the next question is not the same line but similar uh, does city uh, and the per first person to answer this one is uh, Mr. Robles. Does the city of Carson have any unfunded pension liabilities? You can unmute yourself. Reenactment zero. <laughs> I'm very proud of the fact that Carson is uh, one of the handful of cities, and we've become a model for other cities to follow in that we are completely paid up with our outstanding pension obligation to CalPERS. Very, very few cities in the entire state of California can make that claim. Uh, just a few in LA County can make that. And now other cities are following our lead. I'm very proud of the fact that I led that effort. And I'm most proud of the fact that by pursuing this uh, course, that the city 
ended up saving close to $20 million from what we would have had to pay to CalPERS otherwise. I, I'm very, very proud of the fact, again, those are the facts we can, I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, I think it's unfair that candidates can attack, you know, the current leadership, which means me, attack the city, which was, means me, uh, but I can't counter to them. And that's a, a little unfair, but it's par for the course and I accept it. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Deer. Thank you. Well, I thought I led that effort. I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> You know, this is really important. The, the pension obligation that uh, our city faced and other cities were uh, looked really dire. It looked like we were really going to have a, a, a terrible time balancing our budget every year. But we as a city council, and this is uh, the beauty of working in unity, I was very proud of the fact that all five of us were on the same page, uh, the mayor and the four council members, to move the city forward into a program that allowed us to take the obligations and bring it over a number of years in, in payments so that we didn't have a, a, a serious budget crunch. And I want to, I know we're not supposed to talk about the other candidates, but I want to say to all my council colleagues that uh, this was a, a good example of how we could work together um, on the city council to bring Carson forward. And, and that was, this is a prime example of unity works in the city of Carson. Thank you. Thank you. And Miss Many. I actually wasn't aware that the city of Carson has paid off his entire pension obligation as the president of Ask Me Local 89, representing the majority of the represented employees. There's a lack of transparency for the sheer fact that the head of city management never informed us of such. And I am actually quite um, excited for that, considering that our city council under the, uh, my apologies, our city management under the directions of our elected officials have continued to always try to strip away the retirement um retirement plans that we have from our retirees, the medical plan. So I'm really excited to hear this news from my opponents. I appreciate sharing that information and I can't wait to finally hear the results of the union's request for a medical allowance that was given last year in November. And so we're still waiting. I have a better chance of Jesus coming on by before city management um, takes care of business. And so once again, this goes back to the lack of transparency and the breakdown of the infrastructure at the city is that lack of communication. And so I look forward to actually see that the pension obligation so that I understand that we have no administrative fee at all that we should be paying to PERS, which was in the 30 percentile. So I look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Pamela, um, I should have given you more warning, but do we... I've come to the end, sort of the end of my questions that were emailed in. Do you um, have a question that you can start with? And the, per the yes, the chat box has Are been they chatty, very chatty. Active. Wonderful. Okay, very so good okay. questions. Okay, so, so Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Deer, you're going to take this one first. Go ahead. Pat. Okay, sure. Okay, so this was mentioned, but all candidates have not addressed this. So. In the chat, this was the first question. How will you um, ensure transparency? Oh, that is an excellent question. Transparency and accountability is really, really essential to a healthy city government. We haven't had that in Carson and, uh, in the past five years, and that needs to change. Uh, I really believe that that type of change is essential because there's too many situations where, uh, example, uh, city employees not knowing what's happening. We need more uh, communication between the employees and the upper uh, regular employees and the upper management. Uh, I believe that the city employees and the bargaining units need to be brought to the table. And when things are being decided, they should they are stake they are stakeholders. They need to be respected and recognized, and they haven't been. So that's why one of the uh, bargaining units, uh, SEIU, endorsed me, is because I will work to make sure that transparency comes to reality. We don't have um, uh, the accountability we should have uh, because I believe there's too much of this um, um, 
backroom type of discussions that need to be brought forward and rationale needs to be brought forward on why we do things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Many, this is your question now. Thank you. So it needs to start with the City of Council staff reports. Uh, it's the devil in the details in the staff reports. The agenda face might have a certain subject matter, but when you actually read in the details of the staff report, you'll notice that things are glaringly missing and they need to be unbiased. The staff reports should be written from the mindset of what's best for our community, not necessarily in line with the official that requested that item to be on the agenda. And this is very misleading to the general public because technically the council will approve these staff reports, but they don't necessarily understand unless they take the time to understand to read in detail these staff reports. Also, too, we have to engage with our community. Our city's website is it's a hot mess. There is I have residents after residents have no idea how to find any information. You can go to any city other website and easily find the information. You should be able to have so much information so easily user friendly that there would be no need for the residents to call. Instead, you have residents calling out of frustration and getting the runaround. So it starts with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Robles, this is now your question. Well, um, there may be a need for improvement but with that said, um, our city council meetings are televised, uh, except during this COVID period, um, residents come to the city council and they engage. Um, the president of ASME, the employee union, has come to the city and pointed out matters and we've referred stuff back. We've take, we referred many matters that come to us and uh, residents bring up to our attention uh, one uh, nuance difference or another, and we refer those matters back. Uh, so while perhaps there are examples here and there, but on the whole, I invite our residents to watch our city council meetings. There's, there's the, the process of how a sausage is made is right in the open. I invite our residents to visit our, the city's website and see if anything, there's probably too much information on our website um, and I think that our residents know what's going on in the city if they care to be engaged. Okay, thank you. Um, so next up for the next question Pamela has, uh, Miss Manny, you're going to go first. Okay, and it is, what is your position on Measure K, the sales tax increase initiative? I'm actually against Measure K. My preference would have been to do the sales tax blocking or deferral, which would have meant was the residents would approve the sales tax, but it would not go into effect unless the county placed a tax measure on the ballot. That way we would have at least given some type of uh, financial relief to our residents by not charging them a sales tax immediately. But in the event that the county were to come and take it, then we would uh, sit there and enforce it. But I didn't appreciate our city attorney putting down the Carson residents and convincing the council that it would be too confusing, I believe, for our residents to understand. And, you know, that condescending attitude is what I don't care for. Mm -hmm. We need to be upfront with our community. If you need the money, then we need the money. But don't sit there and put our community down as if we don't have the ability to comprehend and understand a measure. The problem is it goes back to lack of transparency. If they could sit there and waste our time for hours on end at every city council meeting, they could sit there and figure out a way to properly explain to the community what the measure is. So, no, I'm not for Measure K. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Robles. Thank you. Um, I'm the only one on the city council that voted against Measure K. I'm campaigning against Measure K. Um, I think that to increase our sales tax um, on our residents that disproportionately impacts those on a fixed income or those are financially struggling is unfair, especially now during the COVID pandemic. I think that um, it's interesting that this follows the transparency. I said perhaps there was instances where the city could improve upon transparency. I didn't support the measure. The measure was put on the on the agenda as a blocking measure to prevent uh, the tax from being increased. Um, if the county increased it, 
but it was changed literally on the floor. Um, I didn't vote for it. I didn't make the motion to to change it, and I didn't second it. Um, someone else did, and I, I think it's ironic that I can be, as a city, attacked for not being transparent, and there's an example where someone running for mayor did exactly the thing that he's accusing me of doing, not being transparent or accountable. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Deer, uh, this is now your question. Thank you. I agree with my two uh, colleagues that I am opposing Measure K. I'm voting against it in the election as an individual, and I believe that the people of Carson need to make their uh, decision themselves. Uh, they have a, have a choice, and this is going to be a choice of the people of the city of Carson. They'll make that decision. I was the one uh, my colleagues referenced um, wanting to have a preventative uh, measure to preserves sales tax in Carson in case, as it was mentioned earlier, uh, the county not just puts on the ballot, but succeeds in passing a measure that raises the sales tax in the entire LA County to 10.25%. In that case, if our blocking measure had been in effect, we would protect that sales tax for Carson only. Right now, if it were to happen without a uh, blocking measure or a, a direct measure, you would have the county taking all of that money and maybe none of it coming back to the city. So I was the one who wanted to have the preventive uh, measure just like the city of Torrance. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Okay, do we have one more, uh, Pamela? We only have time for one more. Um, yeah. Yes? Yes, just one more and then closing statements. Okay, so the chat box is hot. <laughs> they want to know each candidate's position on Black Lives Matter. Okay, so we're going to start with Mr. Robles on this one. Oh. I'll unmute you. Oopsie. Just do it. There you go. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that the excess um, force by law enforcement is unacceptable um, at all levels um, for everybody. I think the Black Lives Movement has spearheaded uh, and brought that to national prominence and attention while uh, many of us um, of color who have, uh, have or have friends uh, know that the excess use of law enforcement force it is a reality and, and it does disproportionately impact black and brown communities. So I commend the Black Lives Movement for bringing that to the forefront. Uh, I remember when it started uh, about five years ago that it was considered a more radical uh, and not part of the social mainstream. And I think because of their persistence and insistence on people looking at the facts, it's what we're talking about here, looking at the facts and how disproportionately some things happen in the black community or black and brown community, that's the reality and that needs to be addressed. And I commend the Black Lives Movement for bringing that to the forefront and for their persistence. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Deer. Yes, I, I, I agree with uh, most of the statements there because uh, as a classroom history teacher myself, uh, my perspective is that the Black Lives Mo uh, Matter movement and all the people that support this effort uh, are doing a tremendous service to protect our constitution, protect our civil rights, and protect the future of Carson. Because I think it's, it's overdue that we have a movement like Black Lives Matter doing this work and i want to praise and and thank the members of the black lives matter uh movement i know it's not one just one organization but it, it's a lot of a lot of people involved uh, making it it to the forefront of the public the public has to know when wrongdoing is is taking place uh, before we had video, I, I'm sure it, it was a terrible experience for many people of color to be uh, un, unjustly and unfairly, sometimes to the point of being killed uh, by, uh, by uh, people that are 
not not uh, visible to to uh, the public. Now it's it's visible. Okay, thank you. I want to thank Black Lives Matter for doing that great work for the, our Constitution. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Miss Many. Everyone is so quick to quote, "Life is a marathon, not a sprint." Uh, people need to realize that the rallies and protests are sprint and legislation is the marathon. So as our elected leaders, have they listened to the rally cries of the people, what they have asked for? What have they done from the legislative standpoint to improve, I go, our situation? What have we done to on the legislative matter dealing with our board of supervisors who are over the sheriffs who what police is the city of Carson? Have we reviewed those policy and procedures at the local level? I have not seen any of that. Have we worked with our assemblymen to write any bills to be presented to Sacramento to change, you know, have true effectiveness, true impact to the daily lives? It's one thing to keep rallying and meeting up, but what is next? It's the responsibility of the elected officials to pick up that torch and handle the legislative action. The people have marched, they've spoken. Now it's time to take it up. And I haven't seen that at all from our elected officials. Whether or not I agree with every single aspect of Black Lives Matter, because with the amount of money they collected, I would love to see more universities built, them send you know African-American kids free to tuition, to university, to something of that nature. But that's my stance on it. Thank you. Thank you. So Pam, we do have time for one more before closing statements. So if you want to pick another one. Okay. There's a lot of chat about districting. So let me let me read it. Okay. So I'm going to read it to get the basis of the question. Carson's districts have been divided based on industry first, then ethnicity of residents. This system provides a district for our Asian community, a district for the Hispanic community, and two districts for the African American community. The African American community's vote is lessened by 50%, the Asian and Hispanic community lessened by 75%, and the white community has no district. Are you in favor of dividing the city based on the map this election is based on and why? Okay, and Mr. Deer, you're going first with that. Okay, thank you for the question. First of all, the map that was adopted by the council was not the map that I was favoring. Uh, I felt, felt this map that we have now was being, it was gerrymandered. Uh, it was actually, when you look at it, you'll see that it was set up so each council member had their own district. That's not the purpose of the Voting Rights Act. It really shouldn't even be taken in as a, a consideration, in my view, on where the council members live. That should not even be part of it. Um, the city of uh, Santa Monica, Torrance, and Carson were each written a letter by an attorney that's been very successful suing many municipalities um, and school districts and special districts uh, forcing the cities to go to districts. Torrance immediately went to districts, didn't want to go to court about it. Santa Monica went to court, spent a lot of money. Carson punted and hired a demographer to do a report. The report was kept secret for a year. So we talked about transparency. I uh, insisted when I got elected city council uh, not long after uh, that that report be made public. And we got a majority vote to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Many, this is your question now. I am for districts, but I'm not for the district map that the city council had presented. It is purposely set up so that every single council member uh, was in their own district. I'm actually excited about the thought of having an actual designated representative. I live on the east side of the city. Uh, there's two main pockets of residential areas sandwiched in between the uh, commercial industrial area. This is the first time we've been chatting in the community, in the neighborhood, that they have actually seen officials in our neighborhoods talking to people. We're long ignored, so now people are starting to understand uh, the benefits of having representation because once you pass that 405 freeway on Carson Street, it's like you're, you've driven into a completely different city, a completely different look, 
everything. Uh, we It's the have and have nots and our side of the city is the have nots. But I do not agree with the map that was put before council and there wasn't much time to actually have any uh, discussion over it because it was presented on the 11th hour in order to make it on the ballot measure. So that's my sense on it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, sadly, we've come to the end of our question period. I know we're also sad, and okay. I'm really appreciative of those questions in the chat box, and so this has been great. Um, say, don't forget our mayor. He, he didn't get an opportunity to answer the question, I don't believe. Oh, really? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, thank you. See, see we work Mr. together Deere. as a team. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deer. I am so sorry, Mr. Robles. That's okay. I got screwed up in my own chart. <laughs> Um, Go that's ahead, okay. sorry. Uh, the California Voting Rights Act was implemented to allow for greater representation. The city faced a lawsuit and the cost of millions and millions of dollars. The city of Santa Monica to date has spent over $20 million. The city of Carson is not as wealthy as the city of Santa Monica. We cannot afford that. So I had been advocating the city a solution to the litigation that we go to districting. Uh, we had numerous hearings and we just didn't have the votes. The, the support was not there for a year, for a year and a half about. Uh, we presented different maps and I had wanted the city to go to districting, but it wasn't there. But at the very last minute, the city council unanimously, unanim every council member supported the city approving these maps not the ones i would have wanted but those are the ones that were approved and now for the first time ever uh neighborhoods from throughout the city will be allowed to have representation on the city council thank you okay and again my deepest apologizing <laughs> okay so um so now we will do our closing statement and because we started with Candidate number one in the beginning, we're now going to reverse it. Candidate number three, which is Mr. Deere, you will start with your two minute closing statement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and I want to thank all the people that are on the internet right now listening to this because I know you're concerned about who to vote for for the office of mayor of the city of Carson. With me, you get the best of both worlds, you get uh, a change. Uh, you also get um, experience. And I have the most experience um, serving as mayor. I certainly have a tremendous uh, success record. I'm a results-oriented, hands-on man of the people. And uh, I showed that as uh, I served as a mayor of the city, and I, will con and I continue that as a council member, and I will actually uh, bring forward, I believe, uh, uh, energetic new way of looking at City Hall. And that is incorporating uh, the, uh, the uh, respect and the, uh, which is certainly needed of the employees. Uh, right now, the morale of the city employees is pretty much the lowest it's been in, in many, many years, probably in decades. Uh, I hear that from the employees themselves telling me that. Many employees live in the city and they are our constituents. So I think change is needed. The uh, other aspect of this, of course, is that we uh, as a city have tremendous potential and that potential can be reached if we stop fighting. I'm the voice of reason on the city council now and I will be the voice of reason as the mayor of the city. I also feel that we have to um, incorporate the views, the opinions of all persons uh, before we make our decisions and not make decisions on agenda items before we've heard public comment. Do not make decisions on agenda items before we read the staff report or before we have discussion. I believe at the city council meetings, we should have debate and discussion on the issues. Thank you very much. Please vote for me for mayor of Carson, Jim Deere. Thank you, Mr. Deer. Okay, Mr. Robles, your closing two minute remarks, please. Thank you. Um, as I indicated, um, I think the facts, if we're gonna look at the facts as they are, the reality that we all live in, not the one that we think about, 
not the one that we alter to try to, uh, you know, attack uh, what's going on in the city. The facts are clear. Public safety wise, Carson is safer today than it has ever been before. The statistics bear that out. It's not me talking, those are the facts. Fact, the city's finances are on a much stronger footing than they have ever been before, even during the COVID pandemic. And as such, we are able to tap into this rainy day fund, if you will, to help us weather the pandemic much better, much stronger than many of our surrounding neighbors. Those are the facts. Fact, the environment um, here in Carson is better. I fought the AQMD and demanded, going to their public board meetings, to bring air quality monitoring devices into the city. And for the first time ever, we have them here in the city. I did that. And I invite the residents to look at the facts. You know, it's uh, very easy to uh, make things up. It's very easy to pretend that we live in an alternative universe, um, but the residents of Carson have an important decision to make, just as we do at the federal level. I'm a proud Democrat. I'm proud that Governor Newsom endorses me. I'm proud that uh, the chairman of the Democratic Legislative Caucus has endorsed me. I'm proud of the, my Democratic affiliation for my entire life. Residents of Carson need to know that we've got an important statewide uh, national election and we've got an important local election that requires our attention to the facts, not to wishful thinking that some candidates uh, may talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now, uh, Mrs. Many, uh, Ms. Many, your uh, closing two minutes. I want to thank you guys for hosting this, give our, our residents the opportunity to tune in. Um, but my heart is in service. I believe that we are public servants and we should serve this community with a servant's heart. I find, I feeling that um, we need change. Our residents have lost faith in our elected officials. Our city has become a joke. It's getting harder and harder to recruit. There's numerous articles that are always written about the city. And I know some of our officials have made remarks about only wanting good news to be printed. Well, stop putting ourselves in a situation for them to report bad news about us. And it starts with change of leadership. We can't expect change with the same recycled group of candidates. And that is one of the things the residents need to understand. I am more than capable to be able to do this job. It's a matter of having a half faith. And with all this too, we need to take care of our community and stop putting ourselves in a situation that we're riddled with lawsuits. And most importantly, the most recent one which compelled me to run was an $80 million lawsuit regarding the development. Also two losses we have from negligence, from the city not maintaining our roads. The reason why a claim was filed against the city because a person busted their face because of an exposed anchor in the sidewalk. These are things that should have been generally taken care of. That's what happens when the city makes sure we are structured properly and that we're on point with everything. And also too, we gotta be effective and efficient and transparent in our actions. Normal year of city council meetings, two meetings per month should be 24 meetings. I lost count or stopped counting after 20 plus special meetings that were called by you know the majority of the city council. How effective is the city being if we're continuously calling special meetings that are held during the workday where most people can't get in? And also too, how effective and transparent is the city when we as, as community residents cannot call in and speak live during the council meetings? You're only allowed to put in a written comment. It starts with us, it starts with being transparent, it starts with reinstilling faith in our community, in their officials. And so we need change and I am that change. Thank you. Thank you. Well, normally we'd be in a room and, and all your people would be applauding you. So I am your people right now. So congratulations. <laughs> great job to all the candidates for all your great answers and participating. And we see there's such passion for your city and all of you guys. So. Thank you for participating. Thank you to all of you who attended, sent in questions in advance. We appreciate it so much. And chatting so that we know what your real concerns are in the chat box. 
Um, so thank you. And just a reminder, this video will be available. It'll be sent directly to the candidates, but it also will be on our YouTube channel and our, uh, our actual um, webpage, which is lwvtorrenceareaorg And um, lastly, but not leastly, I want to thank Monica Fredericks, our uh, voter service chair, who put a lot of time and effort tracked you guys down, forced you to participate. That's the way of the league. <laughs> and by the way, if you'd like to be a member of the league, <laughs> speaking of which, we would love to have you. We serve the city of Carson as a league. And so, um, let me just mute Mr. Deer. Okay. Um, oops, that didn't work. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but anyway, so we would love to have you as members of the League of Women Voters, and if you'd like to donate, we certainly appreciate that as well. And anyone in the city of Carson, if you have concerns or you want to put in a forum, please reach out to us because we are here to serve you and we never hear from Carson citizens. So please reach out to us. We're more than glad to help. So thank you again. Good luck to all the candidates and have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye, everybody. And thank Bye -bye. you, Athena, thank for you. serving as a great thank you. welcome. Appreciate You're all so your great everyone. work as a lead. Thank you so much. You everyone be safe. Have a blessed day. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you again. Okay.